Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Joy at Central is being together for friendship. And being together for fun. Joy at Central is caring for one another. In the home or in the hospital. Central is a place that you can call home. Where everyone has a place. And there is a place for everyone. 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 Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. may be seated. Good morning, Central Church, and welcome. It's a pleasure to see everyone here, and we also want to welcome our TV audience. You're considered part of our congregation every week, and we would welcome, it would be wonderful to have you visit so we could greet you personally. Good morning. Uh, the altar flowers this morning, and this is not in the bulletin, the altar flowers in, are in honor of Mark and Suzette for their years of service here at Central, and uh, we want to thank the altar committee for that. There's a garden tour coming up, and that's noted in the bulletin amongst the many announcements. Of course, our church is very active here. The uh, tickets are going to be available right after the service today and next week. Next week will be the final week before the uh, visit to the, uh, on the beautiful gardens in the Endicott area. 
a couple of uh, admin announcements. This was supposed to be week air sundry, but due to the uh, late delivery of labels, we're going to put that off until next week, and also the two cents a meal deal, which is normally the last week of the month. We're going to delay that until next week also, so be prepared for that. The other announcements are available in the bulletin. We do have a lot of activity going on, the same as every week to week. And if you would look to that and make a note of what's going on and be available. With that, we'll continue with our hymn, Spirit of God in the Faith We Sing, 2117. A reminder, please pass the signature pads that are in the center aisle and pass them back. First scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 3 and verses 7 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had showed him. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord took call to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, 
Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. As we lead into a time of prayer, let us join together the prayer as printed in the Bolton. God of creation's beauty and power, creator of all things in the farthest reaches of time and space, we praise you. Jesus Christ, who had power on earth to calm the seas, the winds, and the human spirit, we worship you. Holy Spirit, source of new creation in our souls, we open ourselves to you. May our amazement at your creative power move us to live on this earth as your true children. Amen. I would like to invite the children to come join me for a couple of moments. Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you on this beautiful summer day. Have any of you ever been sad? What, what have you been sad about? Can you name one thing? Well, what's one thing you've been sad about? Hmm? When people die? Yep, that's, that's a sad time. Okay. Have any of you ever been happy? What have you been happy about? You went to your friend's house. Yeah, that, I bet that was a lot of fun. Now, here's a hard question. Have any of you ever been sad and happy at the same time? Sad and happy at the same time. When? Okay. All right, so you had a bad thing and a, and a good thing happen almost at the same time. Mm hmm Okay, so you were at a friend's house and having fun, but then you thought of something, made you unhappy. Yeah. Well, I'm at this place today. I'm, I'm sad in one way and happy in another way. Both at the same time, we call that, sometimes we call that bittersweet. I'm sad because this is my last day as pastor of Central. Um, I'm, after today, I'm going to be what they call retired. I won't have to get up and go to work anymore. Can kind of can kind of do what I want. And that's a, that makes me happy. I'm glad about that. But I'm also sad because that means that I won't be seeing you as your pastor anymore. And I'll, just a lot of things will change with people that I've gotten to know. So it's kind of a bittersweet thing. But I do know whether I'm sad or whether I'm glad that God is, is right there with me to help me through the sad times and to help me take the good times and share them with other people. Um, so I'm going to have a lot of good memories and I wanted to give you guys some, uh, a memory, too. So I brought something. Uh, so each of you can have one of these. Now, of course, they're, they're different. I mean, they're not only different color, but they have different words on them. So I have three different kinds. There's uh, red with black, and there's green, and then black and 
don't know, what's that, aqua maybe? Sure, sure. yeah, that sounds good. So, uh, you, can, you can have whatever color you want. Actually, I'm going to let you come up and you can take the one that you want, okay? So you can pick whatever color and you can come up right now and there's a, there's a message on it too. You want that one? Okay, do you want to take one for your brother? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you take a different one, a different color, so you'll know whose is whose. You want a green one? How about you, Bailey? Do you know what one you want? Yeah. You want one of those? Okay. Oh, and Sarah already has hers. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm going to have these as a memory of you guys, and I hope every time you look at this, you'll remember the fun times that we had up here thinking about God and uh, God in Jesus and how they help us in our lives. Shall we pray? We thank you, God, for being with us always and for sending Jesus to talk to us and show us your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you all very much.
Let it not be, O God, that praise should rise to you from all places of this world while we hold our peace. Charge our being with the currents of gratitude that whatever may be our momentary mood or fortune, we find reason to bless your name. We thank you for patience that helps us bridge desire and fulfillment for unwise prayers that went unanswered, sparing us heavy pain, for the unwelcome new that led us to discover in ourselves capacities we never dreamed were there, for ancient words of scripture that blaze with light and meaning as our circumstances change, for the winsomeness of Jesus that excites the trust of young and old in every generation. And we thank you for your mercy that holds us fast even when we are hardly worth the holding. It is in that spirit, O God, of your ever-loving grace and presence that we pause to give special prayers for those whose names are before us this day. We pray for Karen, for Britton, for Anne, for Bev, and for Libby. Indeed, O oh Lord, for all anywhere this day who mourn the loss of loved ones, who are facing insurmountable difficulties of shelter or food or health, or the disruptions of war, we pray for Alan and his family on the loss of his brother. We know that you are present in all circumstances. We don't always recognize it, but you are there. And so may the worship in which we engage here strengthen us and empower us to go forth and to be your presence, that we can be your light and your joy to those who need to have it in their lives, that we can be proof of your presence. Indeed, may the joy of what you are in our souls carry us through the worst of times that our hearts and our lives and our livings may sing your praise to the uplifting and the glory of all who need your presence in their lives. We dare to pray these as we pray all things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us in these words, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Most gracious God, from whom we receive that great multitude of gifts so lovingly given, we return a portion of those gifts to you, that those in need throughout our world may come to understand the great love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Second reading is in Romans chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. It's all in the New Testament. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So, what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now all ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin, and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God's blessings rest upon his word. Indeed, may God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of both of our scriptures this morning. Uh, just a quick side comment uh, before I begin. Uh, many of you over the last couple of years have gotten to know uh, and see the results of the work of our chancel choir director, Heather Warden, and you've seen her this morning leading the songs, the, the hymns. She looks like a nice person, doesn't she? She, she looks like someone you, you could rely on, you could depend on, who would, who would be honest with you. Well, several months ago, she said to me, you know, I'm just curious to what your favorite hymns are. You know, because music is my thing. What are your favorite hymns? So naive me, I thought about it, you know, and sent her a list and kind of forgot about it until this morning. And lo and behold, all of the music, the hymns and the responses and so forth are from that list, some of which Heather had to, had to do some arranging to make them fit. So, uh, I, Heather, I thank you for that and uh, for Kathy uh, for backing her up and for Raylene to being here on this Sunday. And Jeff, I'm not sure which instrument he's at at the moment. He's been, been moving around quite a bit. Uh, it, does, it does make this Sunday extra special for me. Thank you all. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as you can imagine, I thought a long time about what I wanted to share today my final sermon as pastor of this church, and final sermon as a pastor in active relationship with the church over some 41 years in different, different kinds of service. Well, something cute or light and, and kind of fluffy. Uh, interestingly, I was at a party uh, yesterday evening with somebody who apparently watches on television, and he says, boy, a lot of times you're, you're kind of intense. I, I'd rather hear something that's a little more light from time to time. And I thought, well, maybe, but that's, that's really not me. So today, maybe something deep and, and profound. I thought, oh, it's just too hot. You know, or we're in summer, it's just too schmaltzy. You're not going to do that. Maybe some kind of, of a of a summary statement that, that could tie up my whole career in some th sort of, of theme that, that ties everything together and wraps it up with a, rhythm, a ribbon and a bow. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about science anymore, but I know that people in physics, one of the, the things they're looking for is, they call it something like the unified field theory or the theory of everything, the grand unified theory that would tie everything together, would explain everything from, from gravity to magnetism to light to motion to time, everything from the little subatomic particles, smaller either than electrons and neutrons, and something that would wrap up the entire cosmos. Well, I don't even know if such a thing exists in physics, but I'm not smart enough to get us even close theologically. So then I thought about stories. 
Stories often help. Illustrations. But frankly, over the last month or two, I've told all the good stories that I could think of. At least the ones that are appropriate for church in this setting. So what shall I do? Then I thought about television. Through the years, I confess, I have watched far too much television. Far too many different programs. But I've become interested as I watch television about what happens when series come to an end. One of my favorite series was on for several years was St. Elsewhere. It's about a hospital, a run-down hospital uh, in in Boston with these uh, hard-working, quirky doctors and nurses and staff who just always seem to have quirky patients come through their their doors. And the whole series was, was just filled with kind of bizarre things that would be happening, instances. And so they were, they were building the last episode of the series. I thought, I've got to watch that. And much of the series revolved around the, the uh, head of the medical department, Dr. Westfall. He was kind of the one that everybody related to. And in the last episode, we got to a point where we discover that he really wasn't a doctor. He was a blue-collar working man. And the older doctor he worked with was his father. And his autistic son, that we saw many times through the series, the the, the boy's grandfather would take care of him and so forth. And so the father comes home and he says, how was Tommy today? He says, well, about the same. You know, he spends all day looking at that snow globe. You know, the snow globe, the thing with the water and the little white thingies, and you shake it and it snows. He just spends all day looking at that snow globe. And the camera zoomed in on the snow globe. And inside was the hospital. And we realized that the entire series never happened. It was all in the imagination of that boy with autism. Didn't see that coming. Another one, kind of at the other end of the spectrum, was the new heart show. Bob Newhart, uh, he's had several different series. He had one in Chicago where he was a psychologist. Suzanne Plachette played his wife, and you know, Bob was always on the the, the butt end of everybody's jokes and so on, and just kind of a hapless character. But the series that I particularly remember was when he and his wife, played by a different woman, ran an inn in Vermont. And here again were all these kind of oddball characters that would come in, Uh, In particular, three mountain men, you know, Larry, I'm Larry, and these are my two brothers. This is my brother, Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. Every time, through the whole series, he would come in, I'm Larry, here's my brother, Daryl, other brother, Daryl. And so the series went on with all these weird things happening, and poor Bob could never get a handle on it. Going to be the last episode of the season. Got to watch this one. Long story short, He gets hit in the head with a golf ball. You have to watch it. He gets knocked out. So the screen goes black. The screen comes back up. He says, honey, honey, wake up. You won't believe this dream I've just had. The lights come on. And something's not quite right. It's not quite right. Until he shakes his wife again and she rolls over. And it's Suzanne Plachette. And you realize that the scene is the bedroom from the Chicago series, not the Vermont series. And he says, I just had this weird dream that we owned this inn in Vermont, and there were these three mountain men, and so on and so forth. And and he says to to Suzanne Plachette, auburn-haired, he said, oh, and you were blonde and wore sweaters. She rolls over and goes back to bed. I sleep. I didn't see that one coming. One of my favorite series of all times, though, was probably Hill Street Blues. Took place in some unnamed city in the Midwest, big urban uh, area, and revolved around the the Hill Street precinct with these hardworking officers, hardworking Captain Ferrello. And it varied between kind of police stories and mysteries to solve, 
uh, and, and so forth, and the personal lives of the officers and the staff. And what I particularly enjoyed about Hill Street Blues, it was done in a series of arcs. So there might be a story arc that concludes on this night, but another arc has begun. And at the end of the evening, we're not sure what's going to happen. And the next week, they pick up that arc, and they finish it. But meanwhile, another one has begun. And so the whole time the series was on, it was never, it was never really finished because there was always something else we wanted to wait to see how they were going to deal with it. Get to the last episode of Hill Street Blues. It's going to be the last one. And I thought, how will they tie this up? Maybe they'll close the precinct because it was one of the worst in the city. Uh, Captain Ferrillo, who's honest and hardworking, he'll get a promotion. The other hardworking officers, some of them will get promoted, some will get fired, and so on. I wonder how they're going to handle this. And the show goes on, and it finishes one arc, and, and uh, maybe two, and then another one begins, and I'm looking at my watch. How are they going to wrap this up? They got to the end of the series, the end of the program, and it was like the end of any other program. The officers walked out of the precinct at the end of the day. Their shift was done. Other officers were coming in. And there were unresolved issues, unresolved arcs that hadn't been wrapped up and tied with a bow. The series was over. But the characters' lives were going to go on. And I thought about that. Many times since, the drama of life, you know, for the people in the program, were still going to be continuing even though the show was over. Well, that's kind of how I feel as I stand here this morning. Central's life is going to change with a new pastor. I mean, church's lives always change when there's new leadership. My life is going to be different as it has been with every job or appointment change that I've encountered. But even though the series, you know, the chapter ends, life goes on. The church and its mission and ministry still go on. There are story arcs that continue because they're not finished yet, and they won't be for quite some time. The question for us is how do we react to that change and what temperament, what attitude do we bring to it? And that's a little bit, the point on that is a little bit sharpened for me today at this point in my life journey. As uh, Carl, in his blustery way, mentioned a little earlier in, in his comments, for anybody who's retired, things are new. Time is all open all unscheduled. You have to come up with your own stuff or you're going to be unhappy. Well, United Methodist pastors, those of us serving local churches and within annual conference, those staff jobs and so forth, we often don't realize it, we don't like to admit it, but we live in an institutional cocoon from the time we are finally ordained until retirement. All our needs are provided. Decent salary, housing, pension, health insurance, expenses. Those who are, who are elders like Horace and me, there's job security like none other. We always will have a job. It might not be where we want. It might be with multiple churches, but we will always have a job. And those jobs are pretty well defined. We don't need to worry about how to structure our week. The routines of weekly worship and weekend responsibilities and monthly rotations of meetings and so on, they set the agenda for us. And so for pastors, I think, because of the seven-day-a-week and weekend nature of our jobs, this shift to an empty schedule is magnified, I think more so than some jobs, less so perhaps than others. But regardless, regardless, there is always uncertainty, and there can be anxiety. 
Now, those of you who know me know that I am far from athletic. This notion of, you know, get out there and tear your guts out for the team kind of thing and take one for the, the coach, uh, no, that, that is not me. Payne and I don't get along very well. So when I hear coaches talk about, oh, we don't have problems, we have opportunities, I want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A lot of times we have problems, and sometimes they are big problems and serious problems. At times, uncertainty can be a problem that is vexing and intractable and difficult. I get that. I understand that. But in reluctant deference to coaches, I must admit that yes, uncertainty can mean opportunity. Uncertainty can mean chances to do new things in new ways. It can mean risking directions one not dared risk before. Uncertainty can mean opportunity to live and grow and have new being in new ways. Now this is actually theological. I mean, I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. It's actually rooted in our religious tradition. If you remember the Genesis story that was read for us earlier, familiar story to many of us, God tells Abraham, take your son Isaac, go up on the mountaintop and offer him there as a burnt offering for me. Kill him and then, you know, light the altar and, and have this offering. Now, I confess, I have been tempted with my own children at times, but not for holy reasons, but for unholy. But I, I, I digress. The fact is, Abraham was willing to do it. As a matter of fact, he was just about to do it. If you recall, what was read for us, he even had the knife in his hand, and it raised his hand, and God said, stop. And then there was the sound of a ram caught in the, in the thicket, in a bush. Abraham sacrifices the ram, Isaac lives. Now, there are a lot of layers to this story, understandably. Abraham's faithfulness, Isaac's trust in his father, even to the point of, of almost death, the place and the changing role of sacrificing living things for God, and so on and so forth. But our focus today is that to notice that there's always a way out. There's always an alternative. I'm told that one of our, the bishops under whom I served, I was never in cabinet meetings with him, but I'm told one of his favorite phrases was, there's always a ram in the bush. So when they would be stuck with a particularly difficult situation, whether it was with a church or a pastor or some, some legal entanglement and they were sitting around frustrated and didn't know what to do, the bishop would remind them, there's always a ram in the bush. There's always a way out with grace, with love. There's always a godly way. Romans 16 comes at it a little bit differently, but it's, it's the same basic point. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life means also now, does it not? Eternal is not just the future, but also now. We don't have to wait until death to experience the good things, the gifts of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus our Lord. Those good gifts of God are available here and now and today. There's always a ram in a bush. And so from television program to the Bible to real life, here I stand, as many have before, not knowing what's out there, not knowing what's beyond. The challenge for me, indeed, is to have an empty calendar and no one to tell me how to fill it once certain things are cared for around the house. I get that. <laughs> I understand that. But there's lots of empty space to be filled. That is a challenge, but I'm excited about those opportunities and those possibilities. And here you stand, Sid, actually, 
not knowing what is out there, beginning July 1st, later this week with a new pastor. It's always challenging to begin new relationships, new ways of living and working together. But there always are exciting opportunities and exciting possibilities, and I can't wait. I'm looking forward to hearing them and seeing what unfolds here at Central under new leadership. Those of you who've been around the United Methodist Church at times like this, you know the drill. When I'm no longer the pastor, friendships can continue. Keeping in touch in modest ways will continue. continue. But pastoral duties and those functions cease. And I know Central well enough to know that you're not going to ask me to officiate at a wedding or preside at a funeral or to baptize someone and so on and so forth. Those are all the province of the next pastor. As I mentioned at our reception following worship last week, um, I'm going to take some mark time, a significant chunk of mark time for me, and a significant chunk of Suzette time, where she gets to call the shots about where we go and what we do. And our time is wide open. We don't have any any grand plans at the moment, we're going to see where the Spirit leads. And after a time, when that's out of my system and our system, we'll establish new routines of worship and service. And we are so pleased, so pleased that your new pastor is open to allowing us to do that here at Central. So finally, as I thought about this morning, I thought about why am I so intrigued about Pope Francis? Why am I so intrigued about Pope Francis? I mean, I've always, you know, kind of followed the popes a little bit because of my profession, but something about this one just has grabbed me. Maybe it's, it's, it's uh, his ideas about an impoverished church he would like to see that serves the poor rather than a financially well-heeled institution that exists for its own comfort. Maybe it's his ideas about the sacred worth of non-Christians, which includes Jews and Muslims and even, heaven forfend, atheists he sees as people of sacred worth. I never thought I'd live to see the day. Seeing the holy in our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters and as if all that wasn't enough, he even said uh, on at least one occasion, you know, we need to have some conversation about whether priests should be married. I don't know how my Catholic brothers and sisters can function under this kind of, this kind of radical thinking. In any event, he was asked how he would like to be remembered in history. For Pete's sake, he hasn't been the Pope for what, a year, year and a half? I don't know. Not long, they already are thinking about how do you want to be remembered when you're gone. And I, I saw his answer in two different places on the internet, so it must be true. If it's in two different places, it's, it, it must be factual. And he says, I like it when you recall someone and say, you know, he was a good guy. He did what he could, and he wasn't that bad. With that, the Pope says, I would be content. Good guy. He did what he could. He wasn't that bad. With that, I would be content. Well, I don't think that's very deep. Certainly not profound. It's not a grand summary statement that ties all of the Bible and religion together nicely. Maybe it's cute. Maybe it's light. Maybe it's fluffy. I'm not sure. But like my favorite television program, the series ends, but the lives and the needs go on. Always looking for rams in the bushes, rams that signal God's abide, abiding presence, rams that will empower us in Jesus Christ, rams of the assurance of the Holy Spirit, leading us that we indeed might be God's love with our neighbors in all places, seeking always, always to serve God through Jesus Christ, to be God present in creative new ways. That's what I'm going to be about.
after this morning. And I know this congregation well enough to know that that's what you're going to be about as well. Shall we pray? We are grateful, O oh God, for the comfort, the strength, the wisdom, and the insight you give us to go forth, to continue the good missions and ministries in which we're engaged, and always be open to the new ways in which your spirit leads us. May we go forth in the name of Christ to serve you and our neighbors in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mark for his uh, service and leadership to Central over the last uh, four, years? four years. And um, on behalf of the congregation, thank you. Leadership, friendship, Suzette. We've enriched our, our music program, wonderful friendships, and we just want to thank you.
as we bind ourselves together one more time. Let's see if we can invite the folks on the top row to somehow join us here. Um, this, again, this visual reminder of our union with one another, union with Christians around the world, with all people of God, as we go forth to bring God's love and message to a needy world around us, we go knowing that that God who comes to us as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, rule with us, rest with us, and abide with us this day and always. Amen. <laughs>